uh, Management School. We have uh, Dr. Mohan Bir Sani. The session will be moderated by uh, Mr. Atul Batra. Uh, Atul is a CTO at Manthan, also chair NASCOM Product Council, and has been, you know, leading multiple other initiatives under uh, under software product, uh, you know, under under NASCOM product uh, team. So over to you, Atul, and uh, Dr. Mohan Bir. So can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. okay. All right, so thanks, Babur, and thanks, uh, Shalini. Thanks, uh, Gopal. That was an excellent session, and hello, folks. Uh, I have to tell you, I'm so excited to help moderate our closing keynote, and actually, what a way to finish a fantastic day, right? So I would say our next speaker is a globally famous marketing and product guru, and we are absolutely you know, delighted and fortunate he agreed to dial in uh, from all the way in Illinois in the US very early in the morning, you know, just like Gopal did. So it's it's really an honor to introduce Professor Mohan Bir Sahani from the Kellogg School of Management. Professor Sahani is the McCormick Foundation Chair of Technology. He's the Clinical Professor of Marketing and also is Director for the Center for Research and Technology and Innovation. Uh, he's actually a globally recognized scholar, teacher, consultant and speaker in business innovation, uh, modern marketing and and actually, very interestingly, AI and the applications to business. I know he's been doing a lot of work on that, and it's very interesting to read that. Uh, Professor Sani has written s uh, seven management books, no less, as well as dozens of influential articles in leading academic journals, etc. His most recent book, The Sentient Enterprise, The Evolution of Business Decision Making, was on the Wall Street Journal's bestseller list. So we're really absolutely privileged here. And very interestingly, Professor Mohan, has also written a book on poetry called Love, Longing and Loneliness in uh, uh, way back in 2014 as so a professor. I think we'll need a separate session on that one from you another time. Uh, uh, professor Sani is a contributor to Forbes, uh, Fortune, Financial Times, so on and so forth. He advises and speaks to global 2000 firms and governments worldwide. Uh, very interesting. He uh, spends a lot of time in India. He's on the board of Reliance Geo, uh, several other multinational corporations. And I also want to point out, and this is something so gratifying, Professor Sani, in spite of being so busy, is very passionate about India and our industry here. And being here on short notice is a testament. You know, I wrote to him, I think, four days back, and he immediately I got a reply, absolutely, I'm there. And so he comes to India frequently. In fact, he was one of our keynote speakers at the Product Conclave in November. And his session was uh, probably one of the top ones. So really excited. Uh, thank you, Professor, and, and over to you. Thank you, Atul. I thought that uh, you know you're going to take all the time just for the introduction. So I would have nothing to say. So that's uh, well, thank you. That was very kind. And it's an absolute delight to join all of you um, uh, virtually. Uh, we're all living through some very very strange times, but I think we can take advantage of uh, the fact that we are all available. We have time on our hands. Uh, to actually improve our, ourselves and improve ourselves physically, personally, spiritually, but also, you know, in, improve our knowledge because that is what is going to keep us current. Um, I'm actually starting on Tuesday te to teach my product management class at the Kellogg School, and which, of course, we are also having to do virtually now. Uh, so this is actually a good test. And, and actually, what I'm going to do is start with what I uh, talk to my students about, and what I have experienced, and I've worked extensively with product managers over the you know past 20 years, and I've been advising you know big companies like Salesforce and Microsoft, uh, as well as a lot of startup companies uh, such as some of you on the call. Uh, so I want to share with you some perspectives on what it takes to be a world-class product manager. And I was really nice to listen to Gopal, and uh, I'm going to echo several of my of his uh, his comments and his ideas. So to start to see a resonance and a sort of some sort of themes uh, that come across. So, so to begin with, um, you know, let's let's start by asking what what does what is the product manager role? In fact, some of you had asked this question even in the previous session. So, what is a what does a product manager really do? So, you notice that I I've chosen my words very very carefully. That I see product manager as strategic and business oriented role that is focused on solving a problem and delivering a solution to a customer and market need. Notice here that the word product doesn't occur in my definition, right? What I'm saying really is, and, and, and several of you, have asked, some of you have asked this question, 
And some of you are thinking about this idea that, look, we're engineers, we're, we're coming from engineering, can we become product managers? Yes, you can, but the mindset has to shift. The mindset now is you really need to think like the general manager and owner of your business, your product as a business. That is why I talk about what does strategic mean? Strategic means that you really now need to take a 360 degree view. Right? You need to really tell your span of control is not just the features of the product, it's the business model, it's the team that's gonna, it's the partnerships, all of the things that, that, that you need to do to set yourself up for success, your sales team and your marketing organization. So that's what strategic means. What business oriented means is you always have to keep your eye on the ball and saying, ultimately, we're driving business goals here. We need driving business success. So it's not about, you know, sometimes I, I meet engineers who want to be, build a cool product and they want to do challenging stuff. They want to work on very interesting development projects. Well, all that is good. But at the end of the day, I love to say that innovation is useless unless someone will pay for it. So you really need to keep that business goal in mind. So those are the two shifts that you need to engender as you transition from a technical role to a product management role. Another way that I thought it sort of start to think about this is uh, that uh, I like to think of product managers in three different ways. These are three analogies that might be really helpful to you as you think about sort of growing into a product management role. As I was saying, just in my definition, the first way to think about this is that the product manager is the CEO of their product, right? So that is so, so think of yourself as a mini CEO. That really, because you are responsible for strategy, you're responsible for the product roadmap, you're responsible for features definition, you're responsible for product, you know, assisting product marketing, you're responsible for forecasting sales and 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 managing revenues and customer success. So, so I just like a CEO needs to look at the entire span of control for their company. That's what a PM needs to do. The second thing, and I love what Gopal said in response to a question on what would be the ideal product management team. The first person he mentioned on it was the customer. So you are the advocate for the customer. So really always ask yourself that what would the customer want? What is the problem we're trying to solve for the customer? And make sure that, that you are advocating on their behalf. When you make cut ad decisions, what features go into the product, what come out of the product, always be thinking about who is that customer we're building for. In fact, the best practice at Amazon is that they actually leave one seat empty in their table uh, in the conference room saying that is the customer. Or what would they think? The third thing that you want to think about from a product management standpoint, you're a builder of bridges. You're a builder of bridges. You need to speak many languages. You need to sort of, you need to speak the engineering language. You need to speak the finance language. You need to speak the customer language. You need to speak the leadership language. You need to speak the sales language. You need to speak the, speak the marketing language. You need to speak design and UX language. So you really need to build bridges because all of these functions are, you know, it's like that Indian story of six blind men and the elephant. Everyone is looking at the product from their perspective, but you as a product manager, are the only one who should see the whole elephant. And that whole elephant should be seen from the point of view of the customer. So those are three ways to think about the product manager. Another very important thing that I have heard over and over again, and I, I try to keep emphasizing, is that you, in fact, I, I, I just define what a product manager is, and now I'm gonna tell you something controversial. I'm gonna say, you're not a product manager. You're actually a problem manager. So what does that mean? You know, this may sound like a cliche, but it's a very, very important insight that you are not in the business of building a better mousetrap. You are in the, you know, there's a saying, and it's a myth that you build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a bat to your door, door. You will build a better product and they'll come to you. No, no customer has any interest in your product. Customers have interest in solving their problems. And if you stay focused on the job the customer wants to get done, the, pro the problem that they want to get solved, you will always be successful. However, if you get fixated on a product, if you get fixated on what product you are building, you will lose sight of the problem that you're solving. Because always remember that there are many different ways for customers to solve the problem that you're solving for them. And there is an existing workaround, an existing way that they have to solve the problem. So your product is only one solution. So if you stay focused on the customer problem, you will not lose sight of this. Let me walk you through, you know, a quote that, you know, Ravi Akela, who used to be the head of product management at Autodesk, uh, said, he said, one mistake that he has made and he's seen made is that you start to prioritize solutions, you start to prioritize feature ideas without thinking about the core problem. So the problem can have many solutions. It's very important to know 
you know, what the, and to communicate to others, which problem you're tackling. And this is what he's saying that the product manager is essentially a problem manager. So don't get caught up in, in solutions and features, you know, in, 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 in uh, thinking about, you know, the product ideas really stay focused on the core customer problem. So let's look at what we mean by the problem, right? So you may be selling a drill, but the customer wants a hole, right? So here, what I'm saying is that the customer, the carpenter has a problem. The carpenter is your customer. He needs a hole in the wall, right? Now, by the way, there is an old cliche from Black and Decker said, we don't sell quarter inch drills, we sell quarter inch holes. But even that is not enough. You know, it's not just about the hole. He's concerned about, you know, what is the speed at which the hole is gonna be made? What is the accuracy of the cut? What is the safety of the device? What is the ease of use of the device? What is the reliability of the device? Where can I buy this device? How much does it cost? Where can I get support? And by the way, as you start thinking about this, you realize that depending on the use case, depending on the persona, depending on who the target customer is, these priorities may be different. For example, if I'm a professional carpenter, for me, what's very important is speed and performance and power and durability. I may be less concerned about ease of use, but if I'm using a drill at home, I'm a hobbyist, then I'm most concerned about usability. I'm most concerned about you know, safety because I'm not a professional. I may also be concerned about price. So you really need to understand the customer's context. It's not just enough to say, we are creating holes for customers. No, you need to know all of these criteria. These are the criteria and how does the customer prioritize your criteria is really something that a product manager needs to bring to the table, right? So don't get fixated on the product, stay focused on the customer problem. Let me walk you through an example of how this is not so easy to do in practice and how you can run into you know, issues. So I was working with a startup company. In fact, I still work with this startup company. I'm an advisor to them. And what they do is they've created a live video uh, capture platform that allows you to interact in real time with someone who's located remotely anywhere, anywhere else in the world. So they did two things. One is they found out how to gyroscopically stab stabilize a camera that somebody was carrying on their person, even if like, let's say you have an iPhone attached to a device and that is stabilized. And the other thing is this, they figured out how to stitch together bandwidth from multiple cellular providers so that you get a high bandwidth signal out of uh, any location, even if you don't have a good network connection. Okay, so this is the product, right? The company was called Georama and, uh, and, and, and this was five years ago. So what is the persona that you would go after? What is the problem you would solve? Do you see how this, this particular device, this solution could solve so many potential problems? You know, so for example, you could use this in uh, disaster areas. You could use this in tourism. You could use this in journalism. You could use this in a lot of B2B cases like product support. So the challenge that Diorama faced, which is a challenge that you will face is, what is the problem that I'm solving? Okay, I built this product, but what do we do? So let me take you through their journey. It took them five iterations to get it right and five years to achieve product market fit. The first idea that they had was we could create a virtual tourism platform where you could actually uh, go with a guide and see a virtual city tour. And the target customers, people who are interested in experiencing places around the world, but either they cannot travel either, they don't have the money or the time. Problem with this use case, people loved it. They loved the idea of tools, but they didn't want to pay for it because consumers, it's very difficult to extract money from them. So the second pivot that the guy did was, uh, and this is Nihal Advani, the founder. He said, let me pivot to a B2B product. Now I can create this as a platform for promoting tourist destination. I'll work with the tourism departments of governments and states and cities uh, to host tours and to promote tourism destination. Problem with this is, the TAM is limited, the total addressable market is limited, and the ability of government to pay is limited. Then he pivoted again. He's like, well, maybe I can, I can actually create this as a way for campus visits for international students. So if you're in China, you're in India, you want to visit a campus, I could walk around campus, I could attend a class, I could see the dorm, I could see the gym, I could meet with people. And by the way, this was a very, very powerful idea because, you know, it's a $250,000 spend that when you attract one undergraduate student to a US university. So if you could get them to pay for $1,000, $500 for a tour, I think they would be willing to do it. It's still cheaper to, to fly but than to fly. But the problem with this is that, again, campuses have no budgets. They do virtual tours, they do tours for free. Then he pivoted again. We could use this as a meeting planning 
uh, site for virtual site visits for meeting planners. So our target hotel and convention centers were looking at you know meetings hosted by companies. Problem here again is frequency of use is low, customer acquisition cost is high. Finally, five year, five, the fifth pivot was that we could actually use this as a video insights platform to do customer research, shopper research. When shoppers are shopping in stores, I could use, and by the way, the secret sauce they added to this was the use of AI to actually look at patterns in the video to machine vision. And so now the target market is brand managers at CPG companies. And finally, the companies off to the races, they're doing very well now. They have Procter and Gamble and, and Johnson and Johnson and many companies like as customers. They've even changed the name of the company. It's now called Qual Sites instead of Georama. So by the way, do you see now how you could get fixated on the product? The moral of the story is there are so many possible use cases and solutions, and you need to really be asking yourself, you know, the three questions is, you know, is it desirable? Is it feasible? Is it valuable? Right? Can we make money? Is it real? And will the customer pay for it? So let now I want to transition to sort of talk a little bit about what are the top skills? Somebody had asked this question in the earlier panel. What was the top skills for product managers? I think that the number one thing I will point out is curiosity. Curiosity. Be curious, be always curious, always learning, always asking questions and getting better and better at understanding who the customer is and what the problem you're solving. You do need intellect. You need a technical, you know, strong technical background is good, is preferred, but not critical. I love to say that I don't hire people for intercept. I hire them for slope. So it's how fast you can learn, not where you start off. Creativity, passion. Passion is really important. You got to believe in your product. You have to be able to speak different languages, the language of engineers, and you have to be agile and adaptable. You have to communicate well. You will be at many times that the product manager your job is to convince people to, of your point of view and people who don't work for you, people who have, you have no authority over. So that is something. So communication skills are being able to articulate and argue your point of view. Negotiation skills uh, are very, very important because product managers need to influence without authority. You know, another funny way I think about this is that uh, since we are from India, let's take, you know, look at the 10 avatars of Vishnu and actual many of many avatars of Vishnu and think about how uh, the product manager needs to, to take so many different avatars. You know, they need to take so many different forms. The observer, this is, you know, they need to sort of think about customers, markets, trends. They need to be the futurist. They need to understand where markets are going, not only insight, but foresight. They need to be strategists to think about what is possible, what is profitable. They need to be accountants. They need to know metrics. They need to know KPIs. They need to know finance. They need to be linguists. They need to speak different languages. They need to be a diplomat because they need to persuade. They need to align competing interests. They need to be activists, advocating for the customer and arguing for the customer. They need to be evangelists by championing the product internally and externally. They need to be jugglers because you need to manage many competing demands and competing priorities. And lastly, very importantly, they need to be handymen. You need to fix whatever problem it is, take ownership over the problem. So I'm going to conclude with seven habits of highly successful product managers. One, be an expert. You have to be the go-to person for your product. Know your customers, know your market, know your competition better than anyone else. Be an owner, take responsibility. Buck stops with you. Product has an issue, it stops with you, right? So, so, so that's the... the the, the other important uh, thing, be persuasive. You will always have to convince people about your point of view. So you have to be articulate, you have to be passionate, you have to be convinced about your point of view. Be an engineer, you don't have to actually be an engineer, hug an engineer, interact with engineers, be curious about how the product gets built. You don't have to build the product, but you have to be curious about how it gets built. Be positive, be pathologically optimistic because this optimism will be transmitted, it's infectious. You know, be a curator, curate the best ideas of your team, celebrate your team and be fearless. You have to be a fearless leader because you will face odds. You will feel for need to function like an entrepreneur. You'll have to sort of fight for resources and you'll have to continuously sort of come up and, and really sort of fight the guerrilla war. So you have to be fearless and really have to be a leader. So these are some of the ideas uh, that I wanted to share with you on what is a product manager and how to be a successful product manager. And uh, now I'm going to pause and uh, take some time for questions. So thanks, uh, Professor Sani. That was a really insightful advice for PMs. Yeah, you know, when I think about success in products, you know, two sort of words come to mind, product manager and world class. So I think you, you hit the nail there. 
Let me start with uh, one question of mine, and then we'll you know go around the room. Uh, you know, in India, obviously, we have a bit of a services mindset, if I could say that, and that's not you right. know there are definitely exceptions there. But often in India, a PM gets too steered by customer versus you know the independent and you know product vision, right, and which needs time and due diligence. And then you know we end up bloating products based on customer feedback versus keeping it to core and then the whole area of customization right that creeps in etc any you've seen it all any any you know words of wisdom there yeah that's actually a, a very very good question atul particularly when you are a b2b company and you have very few but very influential customers right and 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 you can't say no to them uh, it's very difficult to say. You should say no to them. It's very difficult to say no to them. So what you have to do is to 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 really find the patterns. So sort of don't you know you have to really look across the customers to see what are the common themes and common priorities and what are sort of the one-offs. You have to be very very careful of doing one-off customization. So that's one piece of advice I'd have is to look for patterns and to make sure that you're balancing the competing priorities of different customers, different verticals and so on. The second thing that I would suggest, and this is more of an architectural question, is that there is a very important distinction between customization and configuration. So if you build a product that is a platform that has sort of the ability to do last mile customization on the UI UX, you know, on sort of adding some components to it that uh, that customize it for vertical markets or different customers, that would be better. Don't fork the code base. Don't create multiple products for multiple customers. Try to create a common platform and upon which you can actually start to add customization. So look for repeated patterns and start to offer configurability and not so much customization. Great. So we have a question from Raju Desai. Uh, this is a typical scenario we see. So kindly share pathways for transitioning into a PM role from a program management role. Where should one look for help and mentorship to aid this transition? Yeah, I think that uh, actually program management to product management is one of the most common transitions. Uh, so it is. Uh, so I, so I think what what program managers know how to do well is they know how to lead teams, they know how to manage schedules, they know agile, they know you know uh, project management really well. So what you need to do is to beef up the other parts of the product manager role, which is uh, the strategy and business component, right? Sort of sort of thinking about your business model, how do we make money? Thinking about you know customer prioritization because you're going to be in touch with customers. So where do you need to look for help or mentorship? I would say that go to the leader of your product organization. Some of your, some organizations have a VP of product management. Some organizations, you know, have uh, uh, the product management organization may report into certain other parts of the organization. So you need to find who your leader is in the product management organization, and then you need to sort of start to build up the skill sets that you're lacking the skill sets that you're lacking. So as I said, you've got this 360 degree, maybe you know 60 degrees of this really well. You know the technical aspects of it really well. Start to think about how am I going to build my soft skills? How am I going to build my financial skills? How am I going to build my customer skills? Uh, so therefore that, by the way, reach out to your colleagues. Very importantly, go out on sales calls. Somebody had asked, is your salesperson your friend? Absolutely. You know, go out on sales calls. Try to understand how your product is actually working in the field, what customers are really saying, what problem they're really facing. So network, network horizontally and find a champion, you know, from a hierarchical standpoint. And the third thing is build your skills in the areas uh, that you need to beef up in order to get that full perspective. Excellent. There's a question from Nagarajan. Uh, what are the few good frameworks to discover user problems and define use cases, including their un unmet needs? Right. So uh, the one that I like most at all is um, the jobs to be done framework. So the jobs to be done framework is basically argues that a customer buys a product in because they need a job to be done. So in, in, in interviewing customers, in observing customers, what you want to do is to understand that what are the most important jobs that they want to get done. So for example, let's go back to my drills argument. So the carpenter's job, if he's a professional carpenter, is that he needs to assemble a, a wooden structure as quickly as possible 
and it needs to be you know most productive and efficient so that is the job that they want to get done so you work backwards from there and by the way jobs that to be done are described in three ways you know as a customer which is you need to define the persona i want to be able to accomplish this which is the situation and in order to achieve this outcome which is the outcome expectation so that jtbd the job to be done framework and the oe which is the outcome expectation is a good way to discover and also to prioritize customer needs now in terms of finding unmet needs and unarticulated needs problem that customers don't even know that they have what i would suggest is ethnographic observation direct user observation go out you know i like to say to product managers get out of the building go actually observe customers go see the problems that they have don't rely on surveys don't rely on focus groups that's not good enough you know buyers are liars what you really need to do is to understand people behavior doesn't lie so what you want to see is customers in the in the field you know you want to observe customers in the wild so that's the observation the research technique but the approach then is jobs to be done to use that to prioritize and by the way the jobs to be done framework is a is a high level construct when you drill it down it's basically user stories what we call about user stories in agile but this is at the even above the epic level so that's how i would uh, go about discovering customer requirements Great. Really love that uh, buyers are liars. So we just have to tweet that. If someone could tweet that out, please. Uh, actually, yeah, Gopal did mention, uh, I think his first commandment was also products are not built in the conference room. Well said. Uh, yes, Professor, get out a, of the building. A, yeah, yeah, exactly. There's an uh, interesting question. What are the keys to building a successful product team? I assume this is product management and beyond. And what is the top attribute or top set of attributes you know one should look at while hiring? you know a product team yeah so a product team i think gopal said it well atul that then a product team you need to think about the skill sets that need to be represented so you need the customer represented right and that's where the, i think the product manager brings that the additional person who would bring that and i think is very important is ui ux so you need the user in user experience designer because they're going to actually be designing the interface you need engineering because they're going to actually build the product and you need some representation from the customer because even though that's not part of the product team but it's very important in addition then you might based on your industry context have a few other variations for example if you are in insurance or you are in banking or healthcare you need representation from legal and regulatory affairs because a lot of times you know the product that you're building you need to make sure that you can get paid for it that it's not going to violate any you know regulatory requirements so you need some representation from there uh, so so in some sense you know that product team will be a function of the industry that you're in but at the very minimum somebody who represents the the engineering somebody who represents design and ux somebody who represents the customer you know and somebody you know, so those, and so these are some of the essential skills that you want to bring into your product team so in terms of hiring a product team i think that uh, th that what i would really look for is uh, that they need to be domain experts in what they do if you have a ui ux person they need to be really good at the, what they do but on the other hand what they also need to have is a passion for the the product and a passion for the customer so i think passion is very very important uh, and, and as i was saying in my friend my description of uh, successful habits of product managers curiosity curiosity sort of this this notion of uh, I, I like to think at all that innovation comes from the idea of being restlessly curious restlessly curious you should always be dissatisfied you should always want to learn more so that mindset is the number one thing i look for when hiring a product manager got it and, and like they said the, only the paranoid survive and probably yes. thrive <laughs> okay uh, there's an interesting question from Arun. Uh, what is the role of PM in sales cycle? And here, uh, Professor Sani, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, different companies have different models, inbound, outbound product right. management. And then a lot of smaller companies, uh, you know, end up spending a lot of time in pre-sales, you know, from, from the PMs. And also, what's a good balance? There any formula? Yeah, I think that uh, 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 I'll tell you a story probably that responds to this question. I was speaking to a product manager at Oracle several years ago, and I said, you know, you need to actually get out uh, with salespeople and go on go on sales calls uh, to really understand how your products work in the marketplace. You know what he asked, said to me, Atul, he said, is it allowed? Right? Can I actually go out on sales calls? So I, I sort of laughed. I said, you know, uh, it is allowed if you have something to add, some value to add. 
right? So, so in fact, if you are talking to your sales organization, your account executives, they're very protective of their accounts. So if you say, I want to come out on the sales call with you, I want to actually, you know, uh, uh, go to the account, they're going to turn around and tell you, don't, don't bother me because, you know, you're just getting in the way of me selling. But on the other hand, if you say, no, I'm going to help you sell because I'm going to show you how I can, we can articulate the value proposition, how we can differentiate ourselves from competitors. You'll be welcomed. You'll be welcomed by the sales team. So I think that it is very important for product managers to be in front of customers. And my formula there, you would ask for a formula is one day a week. One day a week, you should be visiting customers. Now, the problem when you visit customers, by the way, I'm talking about B2B now, right? And B2C, the analogy is you should be on forums. You should be on discussions and community board, wherever it is that, you know, you can meet customers. So, but in a B2B context, visiting customers, the access to customers is controlled by salespeople. So they need to welcome you and not see you as an irritant or, an, you know, so, so I love to say that you want a seat at the table? Do you have something useful to say? Do you have some value to bring? So see the sales team as your partner, uh, but bring some value to them in terms of helping them close deals, in terms of articulating the value proposition. Yeah, very pertinent advice. So the next question, Professor Sani, if we had, if you and I had a prize to give, I think we, you would agree with me, we would give it to this question. How to manage the founder CEO on the opportunities to be taken instead of taking it all? <laughs> so this is, this is about prioritization, you know, and yeah, uh, like yeah. they say, no, inch, besides inch ride and mile leap. So, but you know, yeah, it's, you know, the founders want want it all, right? So, yeah, I think that. Uh, by the way, this, this is the, there was a very important uh, question behind this question, Atul. Who is the product manager when you're a startup with two people? The founder is the product manager, right? So usually, I say that when you start a company, you need two people. You need somebody to build stuff and you need somebody to sell stuff. So you need a technical co-founder and you need a co-founder who has the business development and market point of view, right? So in 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 so usually one of these people will play the role of product manager. So they're the product owner. But as your company grows, when do you actually put in product management? So in my experience, when you reach 50 to 100 employees, when you have multiple products, that's when you start to build a PM organization. In a startup, it's, a co it's one of the co-founders of the product manager. So as you start to build the PM org, that is the point at which the founders need to delegate. They need to push the, 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 some of the responsibilities down. And what the founders need to do is to sort of take control of the overall strategy of the company, because at that point, the company strategy and the product strategy are not the same thing, because you might have multiple products. So learning to let go, building bench strength is very, very important for founders, because founders, you know, if you don't do this, you will not be able to scale because you're going to run out of bandwidth. There's only so many, you know, uh, things you can manage and so many things you can. So I think as a founder, one very, very important skill to build is the art of letting go, the art of delegation, and the art of creating a bench around you of people who can be product leaders. So that is something that you need to do as you get to like a series B, C level, where you've got about you know, 100 employees, that's when you start to put a PM org in place. So letting go is very, very important because it's your baby. It's not easy to do that as a founder. Absolutely, absolutely. No, well said, well said. So, Professor, in the interest of uh, practicing what we preach, we'll try and finish on time. I've got a surprise rapid fire round for you, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. Three questions. Uh, I think you've spoken uh, through some of these themes. The first one, if you were told that, you know, you, you would be guaranteed 50% of a 100 million TAM versus 1% of a 5 billion TAM. Right. Again, I'll repeat 50 percent of 100 million, 1 percent of 5 billion, both the same. Which one would you readily take? 50 percent of 100 million, because uh, going deep is much better than going broad. And no market is too narrow. If you go deep enough, you'll find more TAM. OK, excellent. Number two, if you were a founder and you had a choice between hiring Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, which one would it be? Uh, Steve Jobs, because he had a better understanding, in my view, of the user and the user experience. But even above him, I'd hire Elon Musk. Okay, <laughs> that, that's a great answer. So number three, uh, Professor, uh, you know, if you were starting your career and knowing what you know now, and both were excellent organizations, would you join a really cutting edge, disruptive startup with very 
obviously uncertain you know uh, business future or would you join a very fast growing multinational with a great product you know world dominating product i'll take a cop out here i'd do both i'd start with the multinational and then i'd go for the cutting edge startup because you need to learn the ropes uh, and then you can do it on your own uh, and that is all conditioned on the fact that i had no prior product management experience i tell my students <laughs> this all the time start with a microsoft or a google and then work your way to a startup would you would you go back to microsoft when it's doing well yes because there are always opportunities in an organization that's doing well okay excellent uh, professor sani i really want to thank you uh, and i want to just give it back to you for any parting words of wisdom we really appreciate your you know more than just showing up here you know you're being a great champion of india india products the ecosystem so thank you very much any uh, parting words of wisdom yeah just pa parting words uh, uh, here are that i think that uh, we are entering into a golden era of product related startups in india and i think that this is something i said in in the nascom uh, product uh, you know summit that we did in bangalore in, in in november and i think that this is we really need to shift our mindset now from saying we're not just the wipro and infosys and tcss of the world we're going to build the google the facebooks uh, of the world coming out of india so i think that uh, this whether it's ai or iot or all of these sort of new technology developments that are taking place think product build product and that is what will allow india to truly scale and i think that that we have the talent we have the skills we have the expertise we just need to now think about the world as our marketplace and really infuse that product dna into our uh, startup ecosystem so i'm so glad that nascom is pushing this whole idea of building products and building product leaders uh, so i wish you all well and uh, i would uh, be happy to stay connected and uh, please all stay safe stay healthy and you know what this too shall pass um, thank you professor thank you uh, atul for uh, for your session and it was uh, it was loved by everyone and i'm, I'm sure uh, there are quite uh, interesting facts that people would have taken there are many things that uh there are many things that people might not have heard before and uh, your research and your uh, research back data uh, that you presented here would uh, would help them a lot uh now before uh before we sign off uh, we have one last uh, you know uh, we call way forward uh, i'll again bring back uh ravi and rakesh uh, to the session and uh, we'll request them to tell us what is way forward from here. Thank you, Vipur. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vipur. Uh, so that was a phenomenally engaging session today. It was very educative, very informative. I learned a lot from uh, uh, from from just from all these sessions. <clears throat> so we won't take much time. Uh, let me just quickly share my screen here. So we can look at the uh, social media mentions. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, Rakesh, uh, what what did uh, you think? What were your takeaways? And uh, how can we keep the product community engaged going forward? Uh, thanks, Ravi, for that question. I think uh, uh, such an informational day. It was great to actually take a pause of three hours and join this P camp and uh, be part of it. Uh, I think uh, great learning from uh, started with Ram, you know, channelizing energy positively during this crisis was uh, was both as a corporate and as an individual was I think one of the key learnings that I had uh, from the session today. Uh, there was a subtle, uh, you know, similarities and dissimilarities between B2B and B2C, which Malti covered was awesome. I, I think uh, very power packed. It's a lot of uh, news sets around there. Uh, Actually, every product manager goes for a UX search. So I think the topic on the UX search was very helpful. How to do it, how to go down to the field, ask the right questions and situations. And the crisp tips from Heeraj and Kapal uh, was so, so good. And, and, and to me, the killer was the 10 of the arts of That was uh, awesome. I think that really yeah. defines a creep 
world and the creator of a product together. Uh, I think that's a that's a very nice way to put that together. And uh, yeah, uh, Ravi, as you know, how do we engage? I think uh, of this year is where we wanted to bring the product community together. Uh, all of us as a volunteer or leaders kind of came together and uh, started this vision of creating this uh, India as a you know product country where we kind of so we created this hashtag hashtag India product um, really to make great products out of India which are successful not in India but across the globe and it requires people like who are there today you know it requires uh, people to spend time here the speakers to spend time there and also the volunteers um, and the first thing that is required the conversation within this product community if you really want to uh, succeed and move forward from here, I think we need to have a very sustained way to have conversation. Um, and my call to action to everyone in the uh, presentation today or in the today would be, you know, right now in the next one minute, go to LinkedIn, go to Twitter, and follow this hashtag of India Productified. Uh, just do that as a first thing so that you will, you can use that as a hashtag to communicate among the product professionals in India, uh, participate and contribute wherever you want to contribute. If you have questions, we'll make sure that we will get the right people to answer those questions. You want to join sessions. Um, so a bunch of uh, initiatives are there in NASCOM. We will start some more, uh, but that's the way to, way to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great uh, call to action for everyone. We need to build on these conversations and uh, let's continue these uh, conversations even after this event. Yeah. And what's the plan for the next camp? I mean, I'm really excited now to attend 